Hey friends, CJ Vegetarian Dude here, and today we're trying something a little bit new. We've got a guest, uh, my good friend Whitney English, who's a registered dietitian and nutritionist. You can find her on her platforms Whitney ERD with plant-based recipes and nutrition advice for adults. She's also the co-creator of Plant-Based Juniors, providing advice for parents looking to raise their kids on a plant-based diet. Hey Whitney. Hi CJ, thanks for having me. Of course, happy to have you here. And so today, uh, in honor of Father's Day, I wanted to bring Whitney on to dispel some of the common myths around plant-based eating for guys. So there's a ton of things that I've experienced personally, and I know I've heard from a lot of you about. Uh, and so I wanted Whitney with the, the science nutritionist angle on some of these common questions that come up. So you ready to dive in? Hit me. <laughs> all right. So question number one, which we've got to always start with. Can guys really get enough protein on a plant-based diet? CJ, this myth drives me crazy. Literally, if you know anything about nutrition, if you've ever looked up uh, the nutrition facts for a different, for some sort of food, a plant-based food um, on a nutrition tracker, you would see that every single whole plant food contains protein. Everything from fruits to whole grains to nuts to seeds, legumes, they all contain protein. Even coffee has a little bit of protein. Would you believe it? I wouldn't advise you trying to meet your protein needs, though, with <laughs> caffeine and coffee. Um, so it's widespread in a plant-based diet. So as long as you are eating enough calories, you're getting enough protein. And that's also because you don't need as much protein as you think. So we see lots of guys online, especially in like the bodybuilding community, that are taking in like two grams of protein uh, per pound of body weight, and that is just so incredibly excessive. The recommended daily amount of protein is about 55 grams for the average man. If you wanna find out your individual needs, you take your body weight, you divide it by 2.2, and that will give you um, how much you weigh in kilograms. And so the recommended amount is 0.8 grams per kilogram. Um, there are about two kilograms in a pound. So you can see how this recommendation for like two, one or two grams of protein uh, per pound of body weight is just so, so much more than you need. Awesome. It's actually hard to not get enough protein. So, uh, there's a lot of dietary strategies out there really in the longevity community that are based on eating a little bit lower protein. And I've calculated my protein, uh, intake for the day before and without taking any protein supplements, any protein powder, anything, I'm always way above my needs uh, with strictly plant-based foods. Studies have shown that the average American actually gets about double the protein that they need. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So the sub part of this protein question is complete protein. So another thing I think here a lot is like, yeah, maybe you get enough protein, but it's not the same as animal protein. It's not complete. It doesn't have all the amino acids uh, or whatever, you know, the kind of qualifiers might be around that. So can you talk a little bit about that? Is plant-based mm -hmm. protein complete? Is it less than meat protein? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, next to the can you get enough, this is probably the second most common question about protein. It all kind of stemmed from a, a lit review many, many years ago where um, a, a nutritionist had written that you have to combine certain proteins like beans and grains together in order to form a complete protein that has all nine of the essential acids that our body needs to grow and that we need to get in the diet. Um, and since then, that same person came back and said that that's actually not accurate, and many governmental bodies have also said that as well. Basically, it comes down to this. Just like all plants have protein, all whole plants also do contain all nine essential amino acids. So if you ever hear someone say that um, beans don't have all the essential acids, that's simply not true. What is true is that certain plants have slightly lower amounts of one, uh, one or more amino acids than others. So for example, uh, beans tend to be higher in lysine and lower in methionine, and the reverse is true for, for grains. And that's why people thought that you had to combine them. But when you look at the totality of the diet, as long as you are eating a varied plant-based diet and eating all of these sources of protein, beans, grains, uh, seeds, 
all throughout the day, your body puts them together on its own. It doesn't need you to sit there and strategically match them up in a meal. That's just not how, how the body works. Interesting. Cool. Good to know. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> in the same, and yeah, I think it's one of those things too with that, like you think about how smart your body is and how it knows kind of what it needs to do and being able to um, figure those things out on its own. I don't know. It's just kind totally. of an interesting. The only time when this um, could become a problem is for someone who wasn't eating enough total calories. So basically, if you're getting enough protein, you're hitting that 55 plus grams of protein a day, which would be hard for you not to, then you will be getting all of those essential amino acids. Got it. Okay. As long as you're not just eating. As long as you're beans. not starving yourself. <laughs> yeah. But even if you ate enough beans, you would, because like mm. I said, they all contain all nine, even broccoli. If you ate enough broccoli, eventually you would hit that amount. Um, beans are just slightly lower in one grains are slightly lower in another. Um, whereas a soy protein is high in all of them, which is why they would say it's a complete protein, but it's a real misnomer because mm. it just doesn't act accurately describe what's going on. Got it. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so shifting gears from protein, you're going to go to another uh, common one that I hear. It's a little bit less common, but it also comes up, I think, when you go talk to the doctors about it too, mm -hmm. uh, is iron. And so mm -hmm. we know iron is present in meat. Um, harder, I think the, the couple things in there is yeah, getting iron and then also iron absorption and what yeah. that looks like on a, on a plant-based diet. You could talk about that. Yeah. So we talk about this a lot over on plant-based juniors because iron is such a critical nutrient for babies and their needs are actually so much higher um, than per, per pound of body weight than any other point in life. It's actually um, a from six to 12 months, babies need 11 milligrams of iron a day. Compare that to a grown man whose uh, requirements are eight milligrams a day. It's pretty mm -hmm. crazy, right? That a six month, six to 12 month old needs more than you. Um, also women need a lot more iron than men. So women, uh, uh, non-pregnant, non-lactating women need 18 milligrams a day. And that's because women lose uh, iron in the menstrual cycle. So that's all basically to say, guys don't need a lot of iron, first of all. You only need eight milligrams a day. Now, a cup of beans has anywhere from about four to six milligrams. So if you eat a cup of beans, you're knocking out about 50 to 75% of your needs right there. What is true about iron is that there are two different forms. So animals contain what's called heme iron. Well, they actually contain both heme iron and non-heme iron. And heme iron is easier to absorb. And plants only contain non-heme iron. And basically our body regulates the amount of non-heme iron your body can take in. So if your iron stores are great um, and they're high, it's not gonna take as much in. If your iron stores are low, it's gonna increase the bioavailability. Whereas heme iron found in animals, your body just keeps taking it in. Now that can be a good thing and a bad thing. So if you were really needing iron, if you were anemic, um, then then that's when your doctor might be like, oh, you should eat red meat, it's really bioavailable. But actually the studies show that too much iron can be really harmful in our bodies as well. Iron is an oxidant, so it can actually damage DNA. So that's one reason why meat can actually be, be a bad source of iron because if you get too much of it, you can be overloading your body. So that's why plants might be a better source. But there's something that we can do to overcome this reduced bioavailability, and that is by pairing iron-rich foods with a source of vitamin C. Vitamin C can enhance um, and increase the absorption of, of the iron found in plants by about three to six times, which actually brings it up to the same absorption as animals. So it's kind of a moot point. Um, and we really naturally combine iron rich and vitamin C rich foods in a plant based diet anyway. Some vitamin C rich plants include things like bell peppers, strawberries, citrus. So if you've ever had a burrito that has some salsa or some red bell peppers in there mixed in with your black beans, you're doing that naturally. Interesting. Are there are there any other examples of kind of natural combinations of iron and 
um, vitamin C that you can think of? Sure. I mean, my breakfast every morning is usually a bowl of oatmeal. Oats are a good source of iron, and I usually top it with some strawberries. So that, that's an option right there. Uh, you told me as we got on the call that you had some lemon pepper tofu for lunch. Tofu is a good so source of iron and lemon is rich in vitamin C. So you did it without even knowing it. Didn't even know. <laughs> Didn't even that. know. It's how easy it Crushing is. Crushing the nutrition game over there. <laughs> One day at a time, you know. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Okay, cool. So we've talked a lot about tofu. Uh, it's come up a few times. And so the another common persistent myth that I hear about, and I think especially for guys, is soy boobs. So soy tofu boobs. giving me <laughs> boobs. Is it pumping up my estrogen? Like, or moves, I, you know, if you will. Moves. Moves is a much better <laughs> you know, combination. So I don't want boobs. I love tofu. <laughs> What's the deal with that? Yeah. No surprise here, that is another all too common but completely factually inaccurate myth. Um, soy has never been shown in any, in any cohort studies, in any epidemiological studies to have any uh, effects on the reproductive system and on, on hormones like testosterone. So there have been lots of large uh, trials that have done, been done. There have also been observational studies and they all show um, no, no difference in, in levels of hormones for men. And there's also no, no reports of, um, of moves, if you will. <laughs> it feels awkward saying that. Um, this all basically, this idea all stems really from one case study. So a case study is where they look at a patient um, and, they, and they describe what happened with them. It's really anecdotal. There's, there's not a lot of science behind it. It's just describing a case. So there was one case many years ago of a 60-year-old man who was drinking three quarts of soy milk a day and he um, developed some mammary. <laughs> I don't think they were milking, but he developed some breast, breast tissue. Um, and that's really where all of these claims come from. One random case study when the large bulk of the evidence refutes that. So it, it's really absurd. And any, any good practitioner, any good researcher knows that case studies, if we're looking at the pyramid of, of evidence and the weight we give to different types of evidence, case studies are up here. They're the very top. Like, they don't compare to the rest, to the mountain of the evidence that, that we rely on. Um, and counter to that, we actually find that men who eat soy have a reduced risk of, of many diseases. So um, one of those is prostate cancer. Um, there was also a, a randomized controlled trial, which would be down here at the bottom of our, our pyramid. These are really the the most credible studies out there where you take two groups of men, you put them on different diets and you compare, compare the results. And this was a study of men with type two diabetes and those who were consuming soy, um, soy with, uh, isoflavins, which I didn't get into that, but I can next. Um, isoflavins are the phytochemicals that people often uh, attribute these so-called dangerous effects of soy to because they say that they're like estrogen. Um, anyway, the, people, the men that were put on um, this, this diet had no difference in, in testosterone levels, and they actually had improvements in, in insulin levels. They had decreases in inflammation and improvements in other cardiovascular health markers. So we consistently see that soy is good for men, doesn't do any of these things that, that the um, pseudoscientists out there claim they do. And yeah, don't drink three quarts of soy milk a day. That's probably not good for really anything. <laughs> a bad idea. That's yeah. Like, who, what bet did that guy lose? I know. I'm like, drink hmm. three quarts a day. It's what like, else did you do? Was that all you did? You just sat and drank soy milk? It must have taken a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of time. Oh, man. A lot of time, a lot of determination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm, you know, I'm impressed, actually. I'm able impressed. To, able to do that. <laughs> I kind of want to try it now just to yeah, see yeah, if it's, right. it's possible. 
Awesome. All right. Yeah, your study questions. would be as credible as that one. So <laughs> if you feel like it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, maybe I'll just do my own. Just do your case own. Studies put it out on the internet. We'll see what happens. <laughs> healthy as can be. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, a couple more couple more questions in here. So the next one, which we touched on a little bit earlier, uh, and it's not not just about protein, but overall in you know, guys that are trying to be either athletes full on or actually trying to just you know, get swole, so to speak. But if I'm trying to bulk up in my muscle or really have like peak athletic performance, mm-hmm. is is that possible on a plant-based diet? Are there other things you need to be considered yeah. of? I feel like this one is getting a little bit more cleared up in recent days, especially since the documentary Game Changers came out. Um, if you are on social media at all, there are numerous, just hundreds of examples of ripped dudes on plant-based diets. There's just no, there's just no denying that you can, you can't, there's no denying that you can get ripped on a plant-based diet. Like I said, go on, follow some of these plant-based bodybuilder, bodybuilders, and you will see that um, there's plenty of examples out there. I think the, the best example is the fact that the strongest man in the world is a vegan. There you go. Um, those, those are anecdotes, though, <laughs> uh, which we just said are at the top of the pyramid of evidence. Um, so additionally, it, that just doesn't jive with what the science says. What the science says is that really in order to build muscle, the, the most important factors are, number one, um, strength training, so uh, breaking down your muscle and building it back up proper nutrition, but it doesn't, it's not dependent on certain foods. It's dependent on certain nutrients, making sure you're getting enough protein, making sure you're getting enough carbohydrates, uh, which is something that people also miss out on. Um, And then of course, genetics. Some people are just going to put on muscle easier than others, but those are the three factors. And nowhere in there does it say that you need animal protein in order to build muscle. Got it. Okay. Feeling more ripped already. Are you? Is that <laughs> yeah. tofu kicking in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. Let me Hope you did some tofu. push-ups beforehand. Up. I'm standing now. I'm just going to start jogging <laughs> in place. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, last question, and I'll do a couple, couple rapid-fire things to wrap us out. So this is really, you know, more common now that we're seeing – not common, but there's these trends around – uh, and I'm kind of merging them together. I know that they're not exactly the same, but paleo and keto, um, I think specifically paleo, where there's this mm-hmm. idea that, you know, men evolved, humans really evolved to eat meat. And that was like a core part of it, of the mm-hmm. diet and kind of going back to that is going to be healthier and more functional um, mm-hmm. for our bodies. And I'm just curious if, if there's any scientific validity to that or just like what you've seen from from your perspective. Yes, these ancestral diets. Several several points on this. One, it makes sense why people would be looking towards history to see to see what what we were what we're supposed to eat. Um, and the bottom line is, there's no denying that people um, in the Paleolithic era, era um, and throughout the course of history ate meat. There's no denying it. You know, we have records of this. Um, What is disputed is uh, a few different things. So number one, anthropologists and and other researchers um, don't have a, do not have a consensus on how much animal, animal food we ate. So um, some people say it was a large contribution of the diet. Some say that it, it didn't really contribute that much. Um, And this also varies by region. So, you know, if we look at hunter-gatherer societies, even in recent times, um, people in the Arctic had a very, very large percentage of their diet coming from from animals, whereas in other parts of the world, in Okinawa, for example, or in the four other so-called blue zones, which contain um, the largest populations of, of people living over 100, the percentage of meat in the diet was very, very small. Um, so, so one, meat may not have taken up that much room in the diet, as we think. Um, and then secondly, it's not just because we did eat meat doesn't mean that 
it is beneficial now. So historically, evolution-wise, meat carried an evolutionary advantage. Food was very hard to come by. It was scarce. Um, and as we know um, from eating a plant-based diet, plants are typically lower in calories. So um, meat was a concentrated, calorically rich, nutrient-dense source of food. So it helped people survive. But nowadays, we're not just trying to survive, we are trying to thrive, we're trying to improve our health span, the number of years without chronic disease, we're trying to improve our longevity. And there's no evidence that eating meat can contribute to that. Like I just talked about in the blue zones, it's in fact the opposite. We see that the longer lived populations are actually those that eat less meat. We may have ate it, it may have been beneficial then, it's probably not beneficial now. Um, we're eating, we may be eating a lot more than our ancestors did. Um, and it may not only not be contributing to our, our survival anymore because now food is, is not scarce. We have the opposite problem. We actually have too much nutrition. We have overnutrition. Um, so it's just not necessary. We can extract the same amount of nutrients from plants now that to meet that same advantage that our ancestors got from meat. But yes, I think it is very interesting. Well, actually, yeah, a thought that I do have is the, even within that, that paleo kind of mindset, like there's this idea that we're eating like we used to, but the other, the other part of that is just how the animals are actually raised and brought to what we're eating. And those mm -hmm. are just completely different than what we would have been eating back then. So even if you're talking about the same animal, the, the species, the way, the, what it eats, its life, all of that, that then contributes to the actual final product that you're consuming is wildly different. So I know that there's some people that are like, you know, Absolutely. only like grass fed, whatever, but for the majority of people on those, and again, blanket statement, uh, but I feel like it's not taking all of those different things into consideration. And it's kind of just mm -hmm. trying to get a shortcut to it, I guess. Yeah. And, and the papers that we do have show that the composition, like you said, of, of the meat people were eating was probably a lot different. It was wild game. So it was very, very low in saturated fat. Um, and that's just not the same as, as the meat that most people are, are eating today. Another really interesting thing is that both um, estimates of, of the Paleolithic diet as well as modern day hunter-gatherers show that they eat uh, upwards of 100 grams of fiber a day. And the average American only gets about 15 grams of fiber. And from the few studies that are out there looking at paleo diets, um, those also do not make meat fiber intake. And that's not a surprise because paleo diet, these other diets we talked about, are really high in animal products and animal products don't have fiber. They have zero. Not one animal product has any fiber. So um, go ahead and eat your meat, but you can't let it displace all of, all of the, the plants in the diet or it's not going to be anything like an ancestral diet. Interesting. Yeah. It's like always forgetting about those grains, which we'll, we'll get a follow-up episode where we, where we geek yeah. out on our, our love of grains. Yeah, not uh, just grains. I mean, fruits and vegetables, yeah. legumes, nuts, seeds. It's, it's literally every plant has fiber and every non-plant has no fiber. And we're learning more and more about the widespread benefits of fiber. We already knew that a high intake of fiber was associated with a reduced risk of every single chronic disease out there, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Um, but now as we learn more about the microbiome, we're starting to understand why. And that's because fiber is what feeds our, our healthy gut bacteria. Um, so there's just widespread harmful effects to a diet that's, that's low in fiber. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, this has been super <laughs> informative. Uh, really, yeah, thanks for taking the time and love to hear this perspective and get the, the science backed um, view on all of this. So thank you for that. Uh, just a couple things to, to end on. I think one, do you have any any recommendations for people that are looking for, you know, more information like this, or as things come out, just trusted sources to get info from? Because like you said, there's all these influencers out there saying things, there's fad diets, there's diet books, there's all this stuff. So if somebody 
you know, everyday person's looking to learn more about this, what, where would you recommend they check out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even within the plant-based space, there are gurus out there who are spreading non-evidence-based information. And while it's at least closer to what I believe in, um, it's very important to always get get um, your information from the science. So one person I really like is Dr. Michael Greger of nutritionfacts.org. He does a really great job of summing up nutrition trends and various um, nutrition topics into really easy to digest videos and articles. He has uh, two books out. One's called How Not to Die and one's called How Not to Diet. And both are really great, um, both for people who've been plant-based for a while and want to learn more and for people who um, maybe are interested in a plant-based diet but not ready to make the leap or not sure how to, how to make the leap. So I can't say enough good things about him. Um, I do a lot of nutrition myth by over on my YouTube channel, Whitney ERD. I actually have a three-part series on soy and myths about soy. And the second video is uh, about moves <laughs> of one of the other topics. So um, that's another great resource. But cool. Dr. Michael Greger, like search his site. He's probably covered the topic. He's covered everything. <laughs> Love it. Yes. And he's, and, he's cre and he's credible. He is very credible. Yeah. yeah. He's got a widespread knowledge on all these things and just quick sidebar on G michael greger i found this through you know the sharing of all the things obviously we're in quarantine right now and both shooting this from home and recording over zoom <laughs> uh and he had a whole talk about the about pandemics mm, i wanted to watch that because i guess that was like the area that he was in before um oh, super interesting you i don't know, think you knew that scary like how much was like predicted in some of those talks that one and the bill gates one both good but yeah. Sidebar. <laughs> All right. I know what I'm going to be doing when we get off this call. <laughs> awesome. Well, Don't threaten me really with a good time, it. CJ. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. Appreciate you joining us. And so, like I said, you can find Whitney online at Whitney ERD across all the platforms. Her Instagram, YouTube content is amazing. Uh, and the plant-based juniors, if you are a parent or about to become a parent and looking to raise your kids plant-based or just learn more about it, definitely check out plant-based juniors. And as always, I'm CJ, the vegetarian dude. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, tag your friends, do all the things. Help spread the good word of the vegetarian dude. Thanks and be well.